Hi, I'm John Eno. And I'm Ivalice Crespo. Welcome to the Reed Smith Podcast, Inclusivity Included, Powerful Personal Stories. In each episode of this podcast, our guests will share their personal stories, passions, and challenges, past and present, all with a goal of bringing people together and learning more about others. You might be surprised by what we all have in common, inclusivity included. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. We have a great session in store for you today, really in honor of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month as well. We wanted to do a special episode. So along those lines, I'm today joined by a special guest co-host. Ivelisse is um, not participating today, but we are really thrilled to have my longtime partner, Janet Kwan, join us as a special guest host. Just a quick background on Janet. Janet, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, but Janet is a real a Reed Smith superstar. Uh, she serves on our executive committee. She's also the practice group leader for our largest practice group in the firm, which is our global commercial disputes group. We've been partners for forever and whenever, frankly, whenever I've had some Issues of me as an Asian American, uh, some things that happened. Um, Janet's probably the first person I go to. She's just been such a great friend and ally and supporter and leader within the firm. But anyways, Janet, hey, good to see you today. Thanks, John. I'm so excited to be here. And I I just tickled that today we're going to talk to Daphne. So thank you very much for inviting me. Well, that's a perfect segue as well. So our special, special guest today is a friend, Daphne Kwok. And Daphne has done many, many things in her short career. <laughs> I say that, Daphne, because you, you said it's longer, but it's, it's, it's just getting started. Uh, among other things, Daphne is the current uh, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Asian American Pacific Islander Audience Strategy for the AARP are really intersecting a lot of different diversity there. So you talk about intersectionality. Daphne certainly can speak to that. Daphne has really been a, a leader of, of leaders uh, in D&I and especially empowering the uh, AAPI community. Among other, among other things, which we'll get into, but Daphne was appointed by President Obama uh, to chair the Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and such a great experience there, but we'd love to hear more about that. I could go on and on, but just another highlight to me was for 11 years, uh, Daphne served as the executive director of the Organization of Chinese Americans, or the OCA, which is a national uh, membership-based civil rights organization. So many other things, but uh, Daphne, just welcome to the the program. Uh, Great to have you on, especially in honor of Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Well, thank you so much, John and Janet. It's a tremendous, tremendous honor to be joining you today and all of your colleagues as well. Well, we'd love to, for the audience to hear all about you and uh, all the great things that you're doing. So let me just start there. You know, as I said in the intro, um, you've been a leader in our community, and I say our, the Asian American Pacific Islander community for a long, long time. Obviously, your role um, currently with the AARP, but uh, as I mentioned, President Obama's commission and so many others. But we'd like to start our podcast always talking about the personal stories of our of our guests. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your journey to you know how you got to be the person you are today. Well, I'll say that I'll start off that I know uh, that you all are a lot of you are based in uh, L.A. in the West Coast, and that I come from the East Coast, and actually not from like New York where there was a large Asian American community, but. Actually, I grew up and have really lived all my life inside the D.C. Beltway, like literally inside the D.C. Beltway in in Annandale, Virginia, which is in northern Virginia. It's a suburb of Washington, D.C. We're literally just like with no traffic, 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. I am second generation, born in Philadelphia, but really have lived in northern Virginia all my life. My parents are immigrants from Shanghai, China. They left China in 1949 with the communist takeover and came to the States for higher education. And so I have two younger brothers and the three of us uh, grew up in an area, in a suburb that was really predominantly white. We had very few uh, classmates. Every school we went to, it was my brothers and I were like the only uh, Asian Americans and just a tiny, tiny number in students of color. I went to the public high school, 2000 students and, you know, I think there were probably about only 10% of us were students of color. And because we're in 
uh, outside of DC, uh, there were many of them that were international students from the diplomatic corps, children from the diplomatic corps. So the numbers were very small. It wasn't really until college, I went to Western University in Connecticut, and uh, I'll confess I graduated in 1984. So when I entered in 1980, they my entering class had the largest number of asian asian american students to date the entering class of 1984 we had 29 out of 600 students were asian or asian american and that 29 to me and then you add on you know the other 3 years i was in heaven it was the first time i actually had classmates that were asian or asian american and i was just thrilled to death and so for me, it was really at, in college that I actually had a family, a community to be able to study with, work with, play with. And, and I didn't really realize at the time what I was doing. I thought I was socializing and having fun getting involved in the Asian American Student Organization. Little did I know that I was actually uh, learning how to organize and uh, empower our community. And really the skills I gained from my extracurricular activities, not in the classroom, but outside the classroom, actually led me to the work that I've been doing my entire life. So I feel very, very fortunate. Daphne, you know, I hear your story and I read the articles about you and the work you've done, and I see so much about achievement and success. But I wanted to hear and ask you about whether you've had experiences with racism, tokenism, microaggressions, or things like that, and then how those types of experiences have shaped your approach to work and what you do for others. Well, I have to tell you, you know, and and I've been in this uh, my entire career, and that question always comes up. And, you know, to be truthfully honest with you all, I feel fortunate that I actually did not experience it. My brothers actually did. They talk about being picked on in school when they were growing up and and, uh, being Asian, being called names and all that. But honestly, uh, I have to say that I, and maybe I was naive too at the time growing up, I didn't know the difference. But to me, I've been fortunate to be able to be in uh, situations and given platforms in predominantly uh, white institutions where I have been able to be the voice uh, for the Asian American community and communities of color. And so I feel very fortunate that I've been able to work in both communities, right? Our mainstream white community, as well as to be able to be the voice of uh, communities of color and the Asian American community. And two very specific examples I'll give is I had the greatest honor of being elected and then appointed to my Wesleyan Board of Trustees. And in that really rarefied space, I was able to learn to be able to be a member of the board, be able to be an advocate and a voice for uh, the student and faculty and alumni of color as well. And I think I was able to do it because I had, prior to being on the board, I had uh, started the Asian American Alumni, had worked within the mainstream uh, alumni association, and had given in so many different ways. The second example is when I was at OCA, I was appointed by the Secretary of Energy at that time to serve on the Department of Energy's Advisory Commission. And I have I had no idea what the Department of Energy does. I don't know anything about nuclear, you know, waste and all of that. But I was put, appointed at that time to serve and be the voice of the Asian American community. And so I feel that I've been um, fortunate to be able to continue to inform and educate institutions that may not be sensitive or know about our communities. That's just a great, great uh, story as well. Daphne, I'm, I'm curious then, um, I'm going to go off the, go off topic a little bit here. Hopefully you don't mind uh, you know, riffing a little bit. But So what inspired you to become such a leader for the Asian American community, right? Because you said you, socially in college, you got to meet some people and created this leadership, but you know, really be, that becoming your career. What motivated that to really be, become your your identity of what, everything you do? Well, I'll give you another confession. I graduated from college with no job, didn't know what I was going to do. And my mom, thank goodness for parents, right, with friends, she pleaded with her friend, can you please hire Daphne? And uh, she was executive director of the Organization of Chinese American Women. 
And so she hired me. And at the time, I also joined the local organization of Chinese Americans, local Northern Virginia chapter, to continue to be involved. And at that time in the 1980s, mid 1980s, there wasn't much infrastructure. There are not many Asian American organizations in DC. And so uh, there are not that many opportunities. But that's how I sort of I started that line of work. And to me, it seemed like a natural going from the work and the uh, organizing that I had done on the college campus, you know, back into the community. But it was really when I became the organization of Chinese Americans executive director in 1990. There, and I had been a, you know, member of the organization. Then I had an opportunity to serve as its executive director. At that time, there were only two paid staff, the executive director and an assistant. But there were exactly four Asian American staff for the entire national Asian American civil rights community in Washington, D.C. in 1990. Now, I like to tell people this was before (laughs) computers almost and was before email, most certainly, before cell phones. This is sort of like the back ages, right, when it came to advocacy and communication. It was everything was by phone and by snail mail. But being put into that position of becoming the voice of the Asian American community, being uh, able to uh, work on issues such as fighting for affirmative action, trying to repeal English-only laws, trying to advocate for hate crimes legislation, fighting for fair immigration reform, all these issues, I realized if it wasn't me or my colleague who is a Washington DC representative for the Japanese American Citizens League, if that person or myself was not in the room advocating for our community, nobody, literally nobody would be at the tables, whether it was with Congress, whether it was with the White House, whether it was federal agencies, whether it was before the national media, nobody would be voicing our concerns. And, you know, one of the things I like to tell people is, and you probably can't tell now, but I was very, very painfully shy as a child growing up. Even through college, I was very, very shy. I hated classes where you were graded on class participation because I would just be so petrified. But that OCA role and position, I realized if I didn't speak up and my colleague in JCL didn't speak up, then nobody would be speaking up for our community. And so I think that's really where I got that drive within me that I was at the table. And we talk about the table a lot, right? Being at the table. If you're at the table, you have got to use that position and your voice, most importantly, your voice to be able to advocate for the community. No, great, great story. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that motivation. And hopefully it, it motivates so many of us and so so many of our listeners just to, if you don't use your voice, you know, no one's going to to raise that. So it's so, just so, so very powerful. I want to switch gears uh, to a different topic, and that's with your current role with the AARP. Um, I think all of us will know that the AARP, you know, it, it tries to advance the efforts on behalf of, you know, retired persons or, or older persons. But Specifically, what are some of the unique challenges that older AAPI individuals face, especially compared to, like you say, the mainstream in comparison? Well, as you may know, that for AARP, we're really working to improve uh, the lives of people 50 years old and older. So it's really about the life journey, right? And especially end of life. For us to address the AAPI community, it's really more of a family, right? Because everything in the AAPI community is around family. It's very intergenerational, multi-generational. And when I first took the job at AARP, I'm like, oh my God, what am I getting myself into? Because all of these issues are really taboo issues for all communities, but also really for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We're talking about end of life issues. You know, who in the Asian community talks about end of life issues Uh, or caregiving or preparing to care for end of life? Or, or finances, money, right? In the Asian community, in our Asian families, you never talk about money, but how important it is to really talk about your finances as savings and all of that. Health issues, we don't share with anybody, even our, in our own family, our health conditions. Oh, you want to talk about health, dementia, Alzheimer's? We're not going to talk about that. So for me at AARP, I'm really trying to help our community norm these conversations to make it part of our, you know, dining room table conversations with family, because it is so critical, important that we address these issues 
and not when you're 50, because it's almost too late even at 50, but we need to really address it when we're 40 or 28 years old, or even when you're maybe 18. We need to really start to think about these issues. Uh, and so I've really spent a lot of my time really trying to get people to talk about the importance of preparing to care for our loved ones. And the challenge is really with our culture and our traditions, guilt plays a lot into it, right? We feel very guilty if we have to place our loved one in, you know, assisted living or independent living. And so how do we maneuver? How do we have those conversations and how do we support one another? Daphne, thanks. Thank you so much for that work. And, you know, I now in my 50s as well in my peer group are all wrestling with these issues. And there's so much about the cultural aspect with aging and the traditional way um, that families take care of their older generation and then perhaps, you know, other different ways now. So thank you very much. When I looked at your bio, I was also happy to see that at some point you lived and worked on the West Coast, that you were not always East Coast based. But while you were out here, you were doing the very important work of serving as the executive director of AAPI with disabilities in California. So again, another intersection of, you know, looking at folks who are also then dealing with disability related issues. Can you share with us sort of what the focus of that work was like and, you know, the kinds of issues that you addressed? Absolutely. I think, you know, at the crux of my entire career, it's really about empowering the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And so when I had the opportunity, my very, very good friends from Los Angeles, Patty Kanaga and Peter Wong had started as APIs with Disabilities of California. And they reached out to me. They had known that I had started a number of Asian American nonprofits. Uh, and they asked me to help them start that organization too. And that was a tremendous privilege because I did not know anything about the disabilities uh, at that time. But for me, if I could help empower APIs with disabilities, absolutely, I wanted to bring everything I had to the table. Uh, but I'll share with you one one learning that I got, which I hope is a learning for everybody when it comes to uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and disabilities. I remember so clearly one young woman in the San Francisco Bay Area who said to me, Daphne, you know, I'm an Asian American, and she was a student at that time in college, but a student. She said, I have a hidden disability. I have an invisible disability. And the model minority myth, that myth that people assume all Asians are highly educated, all great in math and science, and of tremendous income and wealth, that model minority was a tremendous stigma to her because her teachers assumed, because she was Asian American, that she would excel academically. They did not know about her hidden disability. And so that was a tremendous burden because the teachers did not understand why she was not excelling academically. And that is a story I constantly tell and bring up because when we meet people, we cannot assume anything. And, and most certainly we cannot put labels on people, whether it's a model minority myth or anything else. We really have to get to know people uh, and learn about them as individuals. A common theme I, I hear in what you're saying, and certainly from my own observations, is for it, maybe what unique for Asian Americans or AAPIs is that there is a cultural issue in terms of whether it's speaking up, just kind of hiding some of the issues that are, are, are so important to our, our well-being, whether it's from guilt, it's from, you know, we don't raise these things outside the family. And like you said, uh, you know, getting to you know share you know, and educate folks on the importance to raise some of these issues, uh, whether it's finances or, you know, so many other uh, other areas that you're talking about, mental health and, and, and the like. So it just strikes me that, you know, maybe if our listeners aren't aware, but, you know, some of the biggest challenges are educating within the Asian Pacific AAPI community of the importance of reaching out and, and, and speaking up because we kind of feel like we, we have to just take care of it within ourselves, within our own communities. And that's you know certainly a big part of the education. I, I think about, for example, the um, Alliance for Asian American Justice, which is a coalition amongst many law firms and um, some in-house legal departments that are really trying to work with victims of hate crimes and stop Asian hate uh, 
um, hate crimes and the like. And the biggest challenge that um, we face is getting the victims to actually uh, want to come forward, press charges or you know, file litigation against their, um, their perpetrators, um, as opposed to just saying, no, I don't want to, you know, raise any, raise my head above anything. So it is, it just, for me, it was just something that, that really is kind of a common theme of everything you're saying. I think that's uh, one reason why we have to really hope that more people that who have the courage to come out to speak, whether they're victims of anti-Asian hate or discrimination, that they, those that are courageous to challenge the system, that we really get them to speak into the community to show, first of all, how empowering it is and the difference that it does make. Because I've had so many friends like uh, Paul Igasaki, who you may know, an attorney who was at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission as a vice chair there. And he would encourage the Asian American community to bring discrimination cases out, and they really wouldn't. So he would use his commissioner's charge, the ability to raise and bring up cases on behalf of the Asian American community. But for us in the Asian American community, we need to see and hear more actual cases so we can learn and hopefully be inspired and then really encourage others or ourselves to raise our voices and to share and bring cases out as well. Absolutely. So you know, when we think about the API community and we diversity professionals have to do a lot of effort to you know, educate others that the AA community is not monolithic. It's you know a vast uh, mosaic of, of people, of different cultures, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. Really, is as is, is diverse as all the other broader communities. And you've been a you know a real leader, a representative of all those various voices. So I'm curious to share with our audience some of your own experiences, you know, representing this community, and how have you, as you know, ethnic Chinese or a, a, a Chinese American. How have you navigated that to really represent, you know, that entire vast mosaic of, of peoples? Yeah, and I have to say, yes, I am Chinese American, and you know, I've worked for Chinese American organizations, but also been very active involved with the Pan Asian uh, community as well too. Uh, I think as a Chinese American in particular, it is up to us, especially those of us that have the opportunity to continue to inform and educate about the other ethnic groups, especially the smaller ones, like the Samoan, the Tongan, the Native Hawaiian, the Hmong community, the Cambodian community. We have to provide them the voice and opportunity to inform and educate the broader community. I am constantly learning about the other communities and I want to, I wish I had more time to be able to watch more films about the various other Asian ethnic groups to be able to read more from the various authors from the other communities. There's just so much to learn about each and every one of the communities, which is so very distinct and different. So I think for those of us, and sorry, John, I know you're Japanese American, but you know, for us Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans that are sort of like, you know, the go-to communities, uh, because we've been here the longest, that wherever we have opportunities, I'm always trying to recommend speakers, or provide, you know, people that are looking for appointments or or for uh, trainers to really be able to say, oh, do you know this person is actually a Hmong American would be a tremendous speaker. Oh, this individual is a Vietnamese American. I think you need to diversify your advisory council with a Vietnamese American. So for us that are in these positions that we're able to give the representation to the other ethnic communities, it's so important to do that. And Janet, as a Korean American, I'm sure you feel uh, the same way. I can completely relate with that because I also am second generation. So my entire time in elementary and middle school was, you know, probably the only Korean American in school, even in Los Angeles, because this is way back in the 60s and the 70s. And it's interesting to me now to see how popular Korean culture is, whether we're talking about, you know, Squid Game on Netflix or (laughs) the pop bands um, and how that has changed, you know, throughout the generation. But it was in the very beginning, it was always incumbent on me to be able to point out where the country was on the map to explain, you know, what the difference was between North Korea and South Korea and, you know, when my parents immigrated over. So it was a, a heavy responsibility to have a little bit of a educational PSA every time the issue of culture came up. So I agree that it's so important for us to keep that 
door wide open for all cultures that fall under this very broad umbrella. Daphne, so I have to ask you, since we have a couple minutes left here, what it was like to serve in your role on President Obama's commission, the Advisory Commission on Asian American Pacific Islanders, Islanders, and what the primary pressing issues were of that particular commission during that time? Well, as you can imagine, for me, whose whole career has been in the Asian American Pacific Islander community, I mean, that was the top, top, top position or job I could ever, ever dream of to serve a president, but not only a president, but President Obama. You know, I, I never really thought in my lifetime uh, there were, an African American would be elected. And so there was tremendous, tremendous honor and pleasure. We, I was, and the commissioners that I served with, we were the ears and eyes of the federal government to the Asian American community. We would raise the issues up to the federal government and vice versa. We would then be the ears and eyes and be the conduit from the federal government back into the AANHPI community. The topics that we addressed, data, data, data. Every single meeting that we had with a federal agency, no matter what agency it was, we were bringing up the importance of the collection of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander data. More importantly, the disaggregation of that data. Because if you don't have data, as we all know, how can you make policy? How can you really serve the communities? And the distinction for our communities, as we've said, you know, are also distinct, that we have to have that disaggregated data. And so every meeting we went to, we talked about data. The second major policy issue we addressed in every meeting was language access. At the time we served, it was when the ACA had just been going through and improved. So therefore, the implementation, getting people signed up for the ACA was so key and critical. But we needed it in language as well. We needed language access. And when it comes now to the hate crimes, all the anti-Asian violence and hate crimes going on, language access is so important. So uh, that was a key second issue. And the third major issue we were really trying to uh, advance as well to is getting more Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders into the federal government, and especially as appointees at the highest level, because we know if we have advocates that know and understand our communities at the highest levels, then we can hopefully get change and attention focused on our communities. You're just such an inspiration to so many people, Daphne. I'm interested in your thoughts around, you know, that this month is uh, AAPI Heritage Month. What what does that mean to you and, and how should organizations really be celebrating it? Janet, I think back on, you know, our history of Reed Smith and Age Pacific Heritage Month, or I can't remember exactly, was was like, well, let's go eat dim sum, you know, for, for that. But it's got to be more of organizations than just exposing people to food. It's not like, you know, your diversity efforts for our, our Taco Tuesdays, right? You, you have to do a lot more uh, than that. So what are, what are some of your thoughts about the Heritage Month, uh, Daphne? Well, I think for the community, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, May, yes, absolutely, is a time for us to continue to inform and educate our colleagues and our friends. As we always say, it shouldn't be 31 days out of a year. It needs to be 365 days. But more poignantly for this May, for many of us, it is with deep sorrow with the passing of Norman Y. Mineta. And he was one of the authors of the original Asian Pacific American Heritage Week. It was originally a week that went into a month. But Norman Mineta recently passed. He is the icon. And I really implore everyone uh, to please, please watch. There's a PBS, and it's running on PBS this month, but there is a documentary on Norman Mineta's life and the contributions that he has made to this country, not just for Asian Pacific Americans, but for everyone. He was an author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He was most definitely the lead on Japanese American redress uh, and so much more. He was the first mayor, first Asian American mayor of a continental city, which was San Jose. And he became congressman out of San Jose, served in the U.S. House of Representatives, first Asian American to chair a major committee in the House of Representatives. Then he went on to become the first Asian American cabinet secretary under President Clinton as the Secretary of Commerce. And then one of, I think, only four people in U.S. history to serve in two different administrations as a cabinet secretary in the two different parties, 
President uh, George Bush, he was the Secretary of Transportation. And he was the one that ordered all the flights down on 911. And so I think we, all of us, hopefully not just Asian Americans, but all Americans, get to know about how a Japanese American who was a young boy who was interned during World War II used his life experience to really raise raise the livelihood and equality, truly fighting for equality and justice for all of us. So it's really a time for us to reflect on those individuals and pioneers in the AAPI community. And thank goodness now there's so many documentaries, there's so many films about uh, our AAPIs. And so I hope people use this time to really learn about the contributions that so many people have made to this country. Dan, I remember uh, having the privilege of having seen Secretary Mineta speak um, at a conference, and he said on 9-11, when they grounded the planes, this is the Secretary of Transportation, you know, the, the cabinet, the president were talking about we should, yeah. you know, put a travel ban on Muslims yeah. and, and other things. And then he said, you know, having lived that experience, having been interned as a Japanese American because of my race, I think that's the wrong decision. And he said he felt that that first person voice was maybe what carried the day. And so President Bush not uh, you know, going down that road. So, And so that's why representation me. matters, because Norm was at that cabinet table and President Bush knew about the Japanese American internment. And President Bush said, I will make sure that what happened to the Japanese Americans does not happen to the Muslim community. And so that's why representation at the highest levels matters. So Daphne, I think that within a lifetime, you have as lo- as others have as well, but you have really stood out in dedicating your life and really changing uh, the message in the world. And it, again, at another time, we might talk about sort of how you found your voice and how you use it so effectively on behalf of others. But for our younger listeners who are beginning, you know, their life, their their work life, their home life, their family life, what kind of advice do you give as to sort of how to incorporate that into all the other things that we do and who we are? Well, I hope that people as Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, not all of us can be working in the community or, or on behalf of the community, but I hope people really want to be part of the community and take the opportunity to join organizations, whatever your passion point might be, but to help support the Asian American community as well. There's so many organizations that are out there. Utilize your talents. You know, if you have a legal background, if you have a financial background, if you have a strategic background, these Asian American, especially the nonprofit organizations, could most certainly benefit from your assistance. Make sure that you join, whether it's listservs or social media or tweets or whatever the latest might be, to make sure that you're informed about the latest of what's happening in the Asian American community, uh, just to be informed. And hopefully you'll be able to use your voice, whether it's for the legislative side of it, to continue to advocate for or against policies and legislation that impact our community, or if you have the opportunity to be able to provide a voice for others that are Uh, working on the various issues. That is all very important as well, too. And I think for the young people, there's so many opportunities now with technology. There's no excuse why people don't know what the issues are and can't be connected because now with all the latest in technology, we can all continue to be informed. Uh, And so I hope, especially for the younger people, that they will take advantage, but also to be able to balance work and life balance as well, too. Daphne Kwok, thank you for joining us today. You are just such a leader and sharing all your great advice and, and history. And, and it's just so such an honor to have you part of our podcast uh, for our listeners, especially. So thank you for joining. Thank you, John. And thank you, Janet. And thank you to all your listeners. Inclusivity Included is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Allie McArdle. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, and ReadSmith.com. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. 
All rights reserved.